God is good and we have the mind of Christ. At least the parts he wants to give us in the scripture. God is good. God shares with us everything about himself that he wants us to know. And although some of it's barely comprehensible, I think we can all agree it's very, very beautiful. And there's some amazing scripture here in Psalm 22 concerning God's sacrifice on the cross. And we're going to delve into parts of this psalm today a little bit just to get a glimpse of the beauty of the mind of an unchanging God. Before we do that though, here's a gospel message. We're going to go straight over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So Paul, speaking to the Corinthians in Greece, says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Unless ye have believed in vain. There are preachers out there that will tell you that this means you can believe in Christ and in his gospel to no effect. That's a lie. If you're believing on the real Jesus Christ of Scripture, you cannot believe on him to no effect. This word vain is talking about the self, and we know it's talking about the self, because Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes talks over and over again about vanity and tells us that men's works are vanity, that they all come to nothing in and of themselves. And Solomon in Ecclesiastes also tells us that there is nothing new under the sun. So he's telling us that these themes of works and vanity are going to be repeated. They're going to be continually repeated. So the themes that we run into today, even concerning the gospel, will come into play just as they did then. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 say, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. So what Paul is saying here is that we are saved by the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you. In other words, Paul has preached the gospel, the truth. Unless ye have believed in vain, that's anything of the self. That's adding anything of the self to the gospel would negate salvation. If you add anything to the gospel, you're negating salvation. The only thing of yourself that is possible is exercising the faith that God has given you. God has given faith to all men, all people, and the way to be saved is to exercise the faith that he has given. In other words, believe on Jesus, the Jesus Christ of the scriptures, which Paul talks about in these next verses. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. The Christ that we need to believe on is the Christ 
of the scriptures, any other form of Christ that alters in any way from the scriptures is a false Christ. How that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now what does he mean according to the scriptures? Does he mean the gospel accounts? Had the gospel accounts been written? Had the gospel accounts been published at the time of Paul's writing? We don't really know. It's possible that one of the gospels or more had been written and published at the time of Paul speaking to the Corinthians in Greece. But it's unlikely, it's unlikely that the scriptures of the New Testament had been published in Greece at this time. And it's scriptures plural. If he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, then we need to be able to see clearly in the Old Testament scriptures that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and he rose again the third day. We'll have a look at part of this today in Psalm 22. We need to find the resurrected Christ in the Old Testament scriptures. So I'm not going to read the whole psalm. It's not that long. There's a verse I want to start with in particular. Verse 16. which talks, this is David talking about Christ. They pierced my hands and my feet. And this one verse alone is quite astounding in what it's saying. It's in three parts, the docks have compassed me the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me and they pierced my hands and my feet. It's in three parts divided by colons. So we can see it's clearly three separate clauses that form one complete sentence. And I want to break this down a little bit. I won't go too deeply into the grammar of it, but when we look at this verse and then what follows we get a real glimpse at the beauty of God's mind and how he's communicating with us how he communicated with David first and then with us through the scripture so this first clause I'm just going to talk a little bit about the uh, verb tenses here okay the dogs have compassed me. The dogs have compassed me. So what you're going to notice here is a present tense verb in the first clause. The same present tense verb in the second clause. And then a past tense verb in the third clause. So this present tense verb to have it's not had compassed, it's have, and it's also not future. So you've got the verb to have coupled up with the past participle verb compassed. Okay? And when you have the verb to have plus a past participle, that's giving us the present perfect verb tense. So what we have in this verse is present perfect 
the same thing here, present perfect, and then the past simple verb tense. So what does it mean? The present perfect verb tense tells us about something that has happened in the past, it's been completed in the past, but the timing of it is not important. The thing that's important is the accomplishment and how it relates to the present. So this is absolutely astounding. Because God, Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Spirit, is telling David a thousand years before Jesus came in the flesh, something in the future, but he's telling him that it happened in the past, it's been accomplished at an unspecified time in the past, and it relates to our present. The same thing with this second clause here, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. It's present perfect verb tense. It's telling us something that's happened in the past, it's been completed and it's important, it relates to our present. And then, still in all in the same sentence, then God flips to a past simple verb tense. They pierced my hands and my feet. This is an astounding scripture. It's an astounding scripture and it's a beautiful, beautiful way of putting things. And it absolutely relates to what Paul is saying in the Gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 that talk about Jesus dying, having died, past tense, he died for our sins according to the scriptures was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul talks about it past tense. From his perspective it was past tense. But David has been given this scripture from directly from God who's talking about it in the present perfect, present perfect and past tense. So what we need to understand is why, in particular, this last clause is in the past tense. And the reason why, as we go through, down through this psalm now, is because he goes on to talk about what happened. What happened? Or what happens? <laughs> it's confusing, I know. But he's going to tell us what happens after his suffering on the cross. So let's just read quickly down through this and then we'll come to some significant points. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. And I'm not going to break all this down. You can look at the verb tenses and you can look at the words and what David is saying here. They part my garments among them, they cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And this scripture, Psalm 22, 22, is quoted in the New Testament. It's in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 verse 12 saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. If you scroll up through Hebrews chapter 2, 
It opens with, therefore we ought, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Talking about Old Testament scripture, lest at any time we should let them slip. So there's a warning here about not paying heed to the scriptures. And of course then this beautiful quote here from Psalm 22. And there's lots you can look through in Hebrews. Absolute ton of Old Testament scripture quoted in the book of Hebrews. Obviously I'm not going to go through any more of that now. But. So I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye, the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither have he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. Now look, future tense. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live for ever. So here we have. They shall praise the Lord. That's Jesus. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. This is Jesus after the cross. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. So what you have here in these scriptures is the Lord Jesus Christ in the future at the time of his coming back. Verse 28 reads, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. This is when Jesus returns as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. I'm going to talk about this in another video. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he have done this. So you can clearly see, if you know the scriptures, You know that all knees will bow before Jesus Christ in the future. You know that he will rule the nations. All the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee, Jesus Christ the Lord, the Lord of Lords. So what you have here in Psalm 22 after after the blood shed on the cross, past tense, the psalm then talks about the resurrected Christ. You have the blood, the death and the resurrection here in Psalm 22. So when Paul's talking according to the scriptures, this is what he's talking about. You can see the death, burial and resurrection of Christ in the Psalms and in the Prophets. And then this makes absolute sense of the verb tenses in this verse and also in these preceding verses which move from 
here. This is the present perfect tense. That's present perfect tense in these clauses. Moving to a past simple tense. Moving to a past uh, a past simple tense. No, sorry, that's a present tense. Sorry, um, and so on and so forth. My strength is dried up. So you have to look at these verbs very carefully. And if you're not sure what verb tenses they are, because there's lots of verb tenses that all mean different things, then it's worth um, doing a little bit of research on verb tenses because they're actually adding to the meaning of the scriptures. So when we get down to verb uh, verse 16 here this is something it's talking about the accomplishment rather than the timing but it is past tense uh, in, even though it's present perfect it means it's important something in the past that's important and relevant to our present uh, moment either to David in his present or to us in our present to anyone that reads this whenever they read it that's how amazing the scriptures are and the reason this is past tense is because it's going on to tell us after the bloodshed on the cross there's more to come in this psalm that is beyond what's coming in the psalm is beyond the bloodshed on the cross, the suffering on the cross. So it's telling us about death and resurrection in this psalm. Now, I'll go to a couple more scriptures now, just so that we can get a greater sense of this. But this is all through the psalms and the prophets. Let's go quickly to another scripture that you might well know it's uh, Isaiah 53 in Isaiah 53 these few verses at the end of this chapter verses 10 and 11 in particular yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he have put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So, his soul an offering for sin. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So, how did Christ die for our sins according to the scriptures? So, we see the piercing of the hands and feet in Psalm 22, which is the blood on the cross. Christ died for our sins. His soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death so look he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, past tense, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So this is telling us both about the death of Christ and afterwards. And we'll go quickly to 
Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6 says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. Future tense. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. When Jesus dies on the cross, he goes into the earth for three days. And on the third day, he resurrects and brings out of the ground the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints rest in the earth in, Jake, in Abraham's bosom, awaiting Christ. When Jesus dies on the cross, he enters into the earth. After two days, will he revive us? In the third day, will he raise us up and we shall live in his sight? That's the burial and resurrection. There in the Old Testament scripture, Matthew 27 verses 52 and 53 talk about the third day resurrection. It says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. This is all spoken of in the Old Testament scripture. So, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and it's all found very easily actually in the Old Testament because most of the Psalms or many of the Psalms of David talk about these things. When you put together the information that God gave to David in the Psalms, it's incredible how, how much God gave to David to understand because it's Throughout the, throughout the book of Psalms, you'll see the death, burial and resurrection throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament. Um, there's plenty more, plenty, plenty more scriptures on that, but I think it's important to understand that the gospel that Paul is preaching here has always been the gospel. It's what the Old Testament saints believed. They believe the same gospel according to the scriptures, according to the information that God gave at particular times to the Old Testament people. But it's all the same gospel. It's all part of the same account, the same truth the same salvation. Amen. So I'll leave that there. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.